thanking SaneCon for um, accepting my talk today. Um, this has been developing for the past two years since essentially Russia invaded Ukraine, right? So I've been going out and collecting the data, um, putting some analysis to it, and passing that on to you, the consumer. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot, I mean a lot today. Uh, so I'm gonna try to go through some of the slides pretty quick, but if you guys got any questions, please by all means uh, stop me in the middle and um, you know, we'll talk about it. I'll answer all your questions and I'll be here for the rest of the evening too. So a little bit about me. Um, I started my career in intelligence um, in the Marine Corps. Uh, I spent six years in the Marine Corps as an uh, 0231 intelligence specialist. Um, between the Marine Corps and my civilian career, did six combat deployments. Um, I got a big family, like to do outdoor stuff. I'm from St. Louis, um, but the goal hasn't changed. Um, win, right? Whenever I get an assignment, we're always trying to win. We're always trying to do my best. So what's with the name uh, War Collar? Okay, if you guys, uh, my boss is Gene Bransfield. He did a talk at DEF CON some years ago called Weaponizing Your Pets, the War Cadet and the Nile Service Dog. That talk led to an actual creation of a company that now has say 50, 60 employees and uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we're based out of Northern Virginia. Um, so if you guys wanna talk about War Collar at all, we have a pos some positions open in Utah. Um, we um, I also have dope scopes. Uh, it's one of our IoT devices. So if you're interested in any of that, please come talk to me after. Okay, methodology, getting started, right? So one thing I did, I used to work for McAfee, right? We developed a system that mirrored the government's intelligence systems and programs and processes and methodologies, right? So this one's planning direction, collection, processing, exploitation, and utilization. So how does this work, right? You get a task and you start planning and you give direction to your analyst or to your people. Uh, collection, obviously you have to collect data to do a project like this, right? So the collection process. Watching your assets, uh, the uh, collection can be from humans, digital means, um, and all sorts of different sources, right? The other key um, point is utilization. Once you have the data, a lot of, lot of organizations and agencies from banks to uh, intelligence communities, agencies, they have a ton of data, but it's very, very, very underutilized. We have a system called persistent stare, so once we find something bad, we've created a mechanism to always watch that in a circular fashion. Uh, another methodology, the iceberg methodology. On the left is the Green Berets in 1967 Vietnam. So what they realized was they were winning every, every major engagement and even all the small ones essentially, right? So they were looking, um, okay, so why are we losing or perceived to be losing the battles? Uh, they saw the large scale engagements on top, but then they decided we need to affect what's under the iceberg that we can't see, the facilitators, the uh, money people, people running um, alternative governance, things like that. And the same thing with the hackers basically. So we all see this on the news, large scale ransomware attacks, hacktivism, et cetera, right? But if you're not focusing on the facilitators, the, the programmers, the dev guys and things like that, you're really not seeing the whole picture. For data dumps specifically, so if I have a task, let's say the task is a country, uh, just we'll use Russia as the example, right? So I collect from all sources, right? Not just the open web, deep dark web, um, I collect from paid sources, so I do pay for data occasionally, uh, but a lot of the stuff that's out there that you would have to pay for typically ends up being free in a couple weeks anyway, so just wait, and be patient. A lot of OSINT public sources, um, customer data, war collar stuff, as so we'll call it, and that goes all into um, AWS. And basically, uh, we use Apache Parquet for table data. Uh, we spin up an EC2 instance that we can basically search within that database. That goes to three programs. Um, open source targeting database, then we have an offensive and defensive leak credential database. So why are data dumps important, right? So uh, they're an inside look into your organization, right? Um, data in this type is almost never available in standard intelligence formats. And it shows raw and unprocessed day-to-day -day activities of those companies, right? Um, one of my mentors, who's a retired CIA agent, has described just one Russian data dump as more data than that was collected during the entire Cold War. So to give you an example of scale, um, the digital world and these hacks are just incredible. And they really help us see fact-first fact perception, especially with some of the countries. Once we get to, down to Iran, it's uh, pretty, pretty obvious. And so, Data dumps are now common, and you guys probably know that. They're expected and now, and sometimes they're targeted, right? 
this isn't always just government on government. Sometimes this is corporation against corporation, law firm against law firm, uh, bank against bank. Um, but we've broken it down, all sectors, all companies, everything's vulnerable. So I have data dumps just from milk processing factories in whatever country, right? Almost makes no sense, but it happened. So we've broken these down into five primary data types. Insider release, Conti, recently. Uh, when the war started, Conti dedicated its, um, dedicated its hacking power, I guess you could say, to the Russian government, and the Ukrainians on the team didn't like that, so they released everything. Hacked without, hacked, then released with, without a ransom. So uh, you were targeted, they released the data, they didn't ask for a ransom. They, you were targeted, you were hacked, then it was released, they asked for a ransom. Ideological and political. Now I know this is a lot, but there's quite a few um, Russian data dumps available um, through multiple sources. I use DDoS secrets quite a bit, uh, Telegram's a great example, um, all over the place. Additional ones that I haven't really covered in a lot of talks, uh, so we're gonna cover a lot of these. We're gonna go through some of them quick. Uh, I decided to add a lot of crypto in here because a lot of us in the community, we use crypto, and a lot of crypto systems are, have been basically breached to the as fullest extent. And if you're using any of those, you should probably stop. But. Okay, some tools I'm using. The first one, you're gonna see a lot of graphics in here. That Those graphics are from IBM I2 Analyst Notebook. That program is a pinnacle network analysis program for the US government. Um, also our Five Eyes partners in every military. It's similar to Palantir, but it's, it predates Palantir by 20 years. Um, I also use Autopsy for forensics. Excel is a big one, 7-zip, a file split, because some of these files, uh, you're not necessarily getting the individual email, you're getting like the Outlook file, and you can't just open that. You have to use a forensic tool to get that open. Google Translate's one of my best friends because I don't speak Russian. So if there's any translations that are wrong and you speak Russian in the crowd, please uh, yell it out and correct me. But getting started on the actual hacks themselves. So this is from Anon303. They basically hacked influential people with financial, uh, people, Russians living in the UK who have some type of financial interest, right? Um, this is about, uh, if I remember correctly, 380,000 individuals, but there's uh, multiple different data types that are involved here. So you have the individual, you have where they live, what company they own, and that address for that entity. Uh, there's no family uh, stuff in here, it's just the person, the place, and the work spot. Now all this, right off the bat, seems pretty normal, right? So people would immigrate from Russia and they'd um, start a company or work for a company and they have a place to live. It starts getting a little bit more tricky once you start to dig into the data, so spy hunting, right? So this is a very small, this, uh, this address here uh, on the bottom right, it's a very small house. It's a, like a one bedroom um, loft, uh, and there's 10 people there. So that's not too uncommon. Yeah, sure, you can make that work, right? When it starts getting trickier, this is called a master merge. So you're gonna hear me use this term. This is the combination of a lot of data. When I have uh, items highlighted, that's what I'm gonna show basically next. So where does that um, macro piece or micro piece fit into the ma macro piece? So when you get down to it, so this house right here, before 9-11, I went to school for architecture. Right, and there's 662 people and 665 businesses apparently at this residence, right? That's obviously not true, right? The floors couldn't even handle that much weight. So um, is it a safe house? Could be, it could be a pass-through location, right? Um, European immigration until recently is, you know, kind of odd compared to America's, let's say. But for sure, 662 people do not live at that location. Um, other locations, it seems just like maybe we have a Chinatown, they have a Russian district in the UK, which seems to be where a lot of these, let's say, commercial entities and people seem to enjoy. One of those is called Garrett Lane. It's about a nine mile stretch. Um, and basically from the list, let's say 85% of the list is, is what the people say they're doing for a business and where that business is located is not true. Okay, moving on, Vicante. So Vicante is basically Russia's version of Facebook. Um, there was two different dumps, kind of incredible. Um, they boast 100 million active users. Uh, with, from those two dumps, the first one we have 27 million, first name, last name, email, and cell phone. And then the other one we have 92 million usernames and passwords, right? So quite a bit. This is pretty simple, right? It's just 
four rows, so this is easy to put into a program, right? When I do this, I merge the names, merge the uh, first and last name. Um, in Analyst Notebook, we create rows, so I say row A is basically all names, row B is usernames or passwords or what have you, so. And so uh, this is the second example. And so what you sh if you had good password, um, if you had good password policies, you shouldn't see clusters. Clusters are the little circles that are on top. Bad passwords, right? Yeah. Uh, passwords like one 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 Q W E R T Y. And I'm going to hit on this quite a bit because we see you see it everywhere, right? I also didn't know that Russians had a very, very large fascination with uh, anime. So uh, probably from this dump alone, let's say 20,000 other passwords have something to do with anime. I would have never have known, but. Okay, Sultai Boltai, uh, Humpty Dumpty. So this is, um, the picture there is Vladimir um, Anakayev. I'm not actually exactly sure how to pronounce it. Um, basically, he's a hacker group leader. He was arrested in 2016, released in 2018. Um, he's been releasing some really, really incredible stuff. Um, what he's trying to show is he's trying to out all the spies. He's trying to show the corruption. He's trying to show the excess with the Russian elites. Examples like this. Um, oops, let me go back. There we go. So this watch, on the, uh, the, the, the guy who owns that watch is like basically a captain equivalent in their military. It's a... Uh, Richard Milley Automatic Felipe Amasa, it's $299,000 watch, right? So imagine this, we have, when let's say Russia has a $35 billion defense budget, a third of it right off the bat goes to the, um, uh, the director of the Department of their defense, right? A third right off the bat. So money doesn't make it to the troops. Uh, he's also showing spies, or who he thinks are spies, traveling to all sorts of different parts of Europe, Africa, America. Uh, in detail, he's releasing all their emails, uh, like passport A, hey, I need to get my name changed on my password, passport B. Uh, badge, if you're into badge life, I mean, they, they've released hundreds and hundreds of thousands of work-related badges. So the bottom left, he's also basically going after the government, taunting them, like, you don't have to speak Russian to understand the bottom left graphic, right? You know, so if you're like, if you're a rich uh, guy and you have a shitty car, you're a pig. And if you're a, uh, you know, if you have a Bentley, uh, you're a teddy bear or a panda. So. One thing he released is Russia realized that in the Black Sea, a lot of their uh, new vessels can't actually come into port, right? So they needed to, uh, they started a port expansion um, program that actually never came to fruition, right? 35 billion. Um, and in all the correspondence, basically, hey, we need this. We know, you know, uh, water death levels. A lot of engineering goes into ports. It's pretty complicated uh, operation in general. And even by decree from the government, money never made it. So on the left, it's basically a loan document. The government, the project failed so bad. Uh, basically, we have bailouts, same bailout. So the, it's so corrupt that 35 billion they asked for in the previous document never made it or barely made it, right? And then. Um, they had to basically bail the project out, which then still also failed. The one on the left is a banking receipt. Um, so one of the guys who runs the program, um, he personally deposited uh, f uh, 42 million rubles, something like 500,000 in US dollars into his, his account. So everybody from top to bottom, middle managers, uh, even maybe not necessarily people on the bottom are taking money from the Russian economy and putting it in their own pockets. When those same political entities speak up, uh, they are, uh, uh, they're basically taken out of the picture. They're in prison, political prisoners. This is an example of one of them. So uh, this guy's involved in, um, apparently Ikea has a really big issue in Russia right now, um, has for the past 15 years. If you don't play ball politically, they basically, they tatter your name and they throw you in prison. So he's releasing all that. From a political standpoint, all the all the people basically they, they it's all in the open. They don't even in their internal emails. They don't have to be silent about anything at all. Um, one part of this on the left, basically, you know, oh yeah, uh, Pasha's moving all the money to overseas accounts and things like that. It's just it's all in the open. Uh, this guy was fired from his position, and basically the, uh, the announcement is there basically, uh, you could say this PR maybe, or HR departments, saying, okay, well, 
don't say that he was fired. He was let go for loss of confidence, and then they basically highlight parts and reword it, you know, to make it them look better and the individual look worse. The same in people who are running the policy are in this guy. This states essentially that there is no corruption in uh, in any top level of the Russian government. Period. And that's what he's saying to the public. Um, he said, if if there is. It's all at the lower levels. See, there can't be corruption on the top because they're the leadership, right? Because how could a leader be corrupt in Russia? Okay, GOSEC. Um, they've been in the news kind of lately. Uh, this is, um, a, they released two data dumps initially. One was fruit and trailer, trailer rentals, which just didn't really matter that much. But the second is the Russia's UAV program, which is awesome. So the one problem issue with the data dump is every, it, instead of it being a, like a PowerPoint, it's uh, they took a picture of every slide and so it's a ton of PDFs, <laughs> or a ton of pictures. So putting that all back together kind of sucks, but uh, basically everything that you would want to destroy, uh, if, you were, if you're the US military and you're like, okay, well, we want to know something about the, uh, the drones. Like we can affect every part of the supply chain, right? We can affect the C2, we can commit uh, uh, the repair and maintenance facilities. Um, the company that this is specifically is called J, uh, JSC um, Kronstad. They're the ones who are producing these. Um, they have the factories. But they released everything. So loiter time, it's a great thing to know. Uh, does that airframe have a forward-looking infrared FLIR system? And on the left, we can see some of them are equipped with FLIR. If you put munitions on it, what type can fire? How many? How many can it hold? And then how does that munition change the loiter time? Um, this one's called the Orion. Uh, basically, they're talking about its reconnaissance capabilities. Um, a lot of their drones, as you can you might have noticed, kind of looked like our RSQ-1 Reaper drones, right? They rush is notorious for copying our stuff. So on the left is basically the cover sheet. You know, they talk about program management quite a bit. Here's how we're gonna do it, when we're gonna do it, for how much cost. On the left, if you wanna shoot one of these things down, knowing where the fuel is, it's pretty, pretty important, right? So the whole entire fuel management system, right out in the open for everybody to see. Uh, being hackers, I imagine that um, if somebody got a hold of all the schematics for this, you could probably figure it out pretty easily. Doesn't, you can tell just by the screens alone and their command and control um, and their flight control elements. Doesn't look like it's super updated, right? It's probably, uh, probably not using Windows even, but um, yeah, and then all the schematics for line of sight. Uh, how does the satellite, how does the individual in the C2 room or the mobile C2 room talk to the satellite? How does the satellite talk to the, um, the airframe itself? Uh, is there a gap in time for that? Uh, what troubleshooting? So if they have an issue, uh, like if we use uh, some type of jamming software, uh, everything that their whole checklist for troubleshooting. Uh, next is Mos Caprita. So Mos Caprita is basically um, they provide visa support, overseas business consulting, a lot of different things. They were hacked by Network Battalion 65. They're kind of loosely associated with Anonymous. Um, Really interesting data dump. So we've got a lot of emails, 150,000 emails. We got uh, 8,200 uh, 8, files. Um, and they work with Russia's Department of Commerce. Now, whenever like I say something like Department of Commerce, if you had an idea in your head that that's kind of like a US Department of Commerce, just put that idea down. That's not how it works in Russia. Their departments are not like ours. It's, they work very, very differently. From a military perspective, uh, any bets in here, by the way? Anybody? There we go, there we go. All right, so um, I spent some time with Special Operations as a targeter, um, and in GWAT we got really good at intelligence, not just targeting intelligence, like here's the house, the dude's gonna be there, right? But uh, what type of door is it? Does that door swing in or does it swing out? Do we have to blow that door or can we kick it, right? Those type of things. If we go to war with Russia and we end up on the ground, this data dump's gonna come in really handy because we have all the architectural um, schematics for Russia. We also know where all the infrastructure's messed up from the contractors, right? That creates a huge vulnerability, right? So unless Russia changes, you know, 87, 89% of all of Moscow, now well, they're already screwed, so. 
and they spend an exorbitant amount of money on fireworks. I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Now I want to open this real quick. Let me uh, go out. And their firecrackers are obviously cooler than ours, but yep, boom. I'm just going to scroll through this real quick, but there we go. I mean, I don't know why, but they had like you know, 40, 50, 60 ads for fireworks in there and then their whole firework budget you know, for their holidays. Kind of cool. There we go. Okay. Yep. So the Chamber of Commerce, like a lot of U.S. entities, probably one of the only things that is, uh, I guess you could say similar is that the leadership of that organization gets a, basically a morning brief, is what we would call it, or an in some intelligence summary, right? Uh, this is one example of those from 2021 where they're discussing Internet of Things devices, they're discussing um, Jens Bullman, the German Economic Foreman Committee Chairman, uh, two different apps they're considering using, Glue Up and Zoom, and compliance preparations for like a future, um, future audit. So they also regulate the maximum price that you can pay per contract, right? It's not really from, don't think of it as a counter uh, corruption thing, but like, hey, okay, so paving the road, you can't charge more than X, Y, and Z, right? So they regulate that for the entire country. Um, da -da -da -da. So with that, and then uh, that second picture to the right is basically stating like, uh, <laughs> They're trying to automate certain things so that they can limit corruption. Basically, they're going to have a government program, so they, you know, instead of having it in people's hands, they're going to try to automate, right? They, they see automation as a solution to at least partial corruption, or at least getting the money to the spot that it has to so they can actually do the job. Okay, so this one was, who attacked this? Uh, this was hacked by RoughSec and Team OneFist. Adult escorts.ru. So the one thing about this one, like, if you go anywhere, it's probably all the girls th that would be fit, uh, featured on this website that was breached, right? 99.9% .9 of them are human trafficked, right? So whenever you engage in activities like this, somebody's getting hurt. Like, they're not there on their own accord, typically. So um, breaches like this help us with an understanding of European human trafficking networks. Um, and this one's pretty significant. Uh, this is just an example, a micro example of just one example. So they saved all the emails, right? And they put them in different categories for the girls, uh, the prices, locations, whether it's France, Italy, Germany, et cetera, Austria. And this is an example, a micro example of what one of these communications would look like. Um, and this one, basically, the guy's saying his name's Jean-Marc, he's 66 years old. Uh, he's one, uh, one, 1 1.73 meters tall. Uh, uh, he's a grandfather, a father of three kids, uh, he, and he, then he's like kind of apologizing, saying, you know, typically, I know you wouldn't like a guy kind of like me, but, uh, you know, I need to hire you for five hours, et cetera, so. And then he instructions on, um, and he talks about how he was a teacher, um, and he, uh, uh, he likes to sleep with, uh, let me see my translation here, sorry. Uh, he likes spending his time having sex with students. That's one thing he says directly, so not good. On the other, on the different side of the spectrum, the Japanese, very polite with their conversations. Um, our Japanese culture, um, doing things like this is more acceptable than in, in most cultures. Okay, moving on to Sherbank, hacked by Anonymous, right? So it's lar uh, oldest and largest bank in Russia and the uh, Soviet bloc countries. Now, one thing I found really interesting with this one, and I'm going to go off screen here for a sec. Let me go down. So before Russia invaded um, Ukraine, um, they realized that their cyber capacity or the cyber, cyber protection at minimum in Russia was very limited, right? So they were trying to outsource this. A lot of it's U.S.-based companies, and I'm told there are you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of these um, PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint presentations from sales, right? Um, mostly U.S.-based companies. Uh, this one's mostly in English, right? So, um, and I used to work for Intel, right? <laughs> 
And but is this weird? No, not necessarily, right? Because obviously before the war, if, if Russia wanted to hire Intel, McAfee, Symantec, it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, sure. And with some exceptions, you know. Now, another one I found really interesting is Huawei. So Huawei ha has a program to monitor gaming, but it's not just gaming, and I don't speak Russian, so uh, I haven't had this professionally translated either, but let's go down just a little bit more. Okay, some games that they're looking at directly. So a lot of these are some of the most popular games in America too, right? So they have your kids or your data, right? And they're actively monitoring how you play, what to play, then how to tailor ad results to you. Um, that's one thing I do know about this, right? So very interesting. Bum, 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 bum. Oops, there we go. Let me go back. Okay, yeah. Um, also with this data dump, tons of financials, right? I have, any, um, there's so many, uh, it's hard to go through. Um, but if you ever want to, if you ever want access to that, just you'll have my contact information at the end. It's it's pretty uh, it's pretty interesting the way their banking system works. It's interesting the way they approach uh, money transfers, especially now uh, that uh, we've taken away SWIFT from them. So some of the new to this one's a little older. That one combined with some of the newer ones, pretty interesting how they've uh, modified their approach. Okay, the FSB. So more spy hunting, right? Um, uh, the Ukraine government has been releasing a list of thousands and thousands of troops names of here's all the uh, all the troops that are in um, Russian troops in Ukraine. They're doing that partially with cell phone data. You know, they're you know, once they move across the border into Ukraine, they're using Ukrainian cell towers. The Ukraine government has access to that. They're basically tabling the data and releasing it for free. Um, uh, if you're not aware, the FSB is the KGB, uh, is the successor to the KGB. Um, you could kind of think of it like the FBI, but a little bit more to it, whereas the FBI is all internal, um, all US-based essentially uh, law enforcement, whereas theirs is internal and external. Um, and in this specific dump, we got uh, 1, uh, 1,248 individual uh, FSB agents. So taking it from macro to micro, right? If you're like this guy, never coming to an America, right? He's never gonna enter a US embassy, right? We have this information now, right? It's not just that we have the information, we have, uh, we have his real name, we have his real picture, we have his nom de gore, his, um, his alias basically, when he's traveling to do FSB type work abroad. His social media, um, people who he lives with, whether that be family or, um, or other agents, um, and we have a bunch of that. Now, 1,200 is just tip of the ice, tip of the spear, right? And we got a lot more since then. It just takes time to put everything together. Even better, right? So uh, Nikolai Yur, um, Yurlev, the head of the head of the Department of Military Counterintelligence, pretty good guy to have information on, right? From an uh, intelligence collection capacity, right? He'd be somebody we'd really want to talk to. Um, a, uh, if, if, if anybody's familiar with human, human intelligence, human, you wouldn't actually go directly to the top, right? But maybe you could uh, talk to his daughter, right? You could, you know, now that we have his daughter, her name, her picture, her social media, right? And his associates, right? You start at the bottom somewhere and you can work your way up. Um, you know, obviously very small wares come to mind. Um, they also released basically what's considered, if you're not familiar with it, sparrows. Um, sparrows are Russian intelligence agents and collectors who um, seek out uh, men or women. Uh, once they start a relationship with you, sometimes it could be as simple as they come over for coffee and they um, put a listening device in your house, or they plug a thumb drive into a computer, or they steal your heart, and then eventually you tell them all the secrets of the US government, right? It's, it's been going on as long as there's been war, there's been intel, and this activity's been going on. Okay, Russian casualties. Uh, so these are, this is, uh, the pictures on top are from new, I put these in yesterday. Um, the one on the left's interesting, obviously Chechnyan. Um, that is the Saudi Arabian flag. It says, be, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. Um, Seen a lot more Chechnyans getting killed on the battlefield. Um, 
And the guy in the middle has English, I don't know if you can see his hands. Uh, it says, one hand says pity and one hand says fool. So pity the fool. Uh, and as of yesterday, they lost 3,000 officers. Now the total numbers on both sides have been skewed dramatically, it's propaganda. But the one way we're trying to get a more accurate, um, a more accurate casualty count, essentially, is through the moms, right? The mothers in Russia are really pissed off. Same with, um, same with Chechnya, they don't want their children and their sons being killed. So I didn't know this until starting this. Um, all funeral homes, crematories, and cemeteries are owned by the Russian government. Everything's, it's all state owned. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but we're, we're basically, we're scraping Telegram, Twitter, VK, uh, kind of great first steps. And we're looking for uh, basically pictures that are on the bottom for keywords. Um, uh, killed, they, they're using some very interesting terminology for like the way they're describing the war internally, like what they're doing there. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and having been in combat, you know, it's, it is sad, right? These guys are kind of need, need, needlessly being killed. But the current estimate for the Russian side alone is, and this could be completely wrong, not really 100% sure, but 176,000 is looking like um, to really, Russia has historically been uh, casualty immune because they can just kind of throw bodies at any type of problem. Um, wounded, about half a million, give or take. Um, they're gonna have to lose half a million people in order to start affecting, um, affecting their plan in Ukraine. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, the mothers have really been a, a big help making accurate assessments. And other things to do with the data, it's helped, it helps us actually identify Russian military units. So these units don't necessarily have a website, right? We will understand their structure, you know, you know, brigade, battalion, down to the platoon level, right? We don't necessarily know where those are, what is the troop strength, how do they arm themselves. But this data has really helped just pictures alone. Like some units obviously don't have crew served um, weapon systems, some don't have anti-armor, anti-tank, uh, some don't have anti-aircraft, right? So it's, 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 then we're putting military symbology on each unit as it kind of comes in with the casualties. And this is the master merge of some of the casualties. Um, there's, I probably have 30 master merges that we put together, but it's too hard to see on the screen essentially, so. But one thing I've been able to do is I've been able to take it down to the district, or you, you could say basically an equivalent to our counties or parishes, um, and then the town, and then the individuals, and then link it to, in this case, uh, these are tel uh, VK and Telegram links, right? To prove the actual person, the name match, and yes, they are a casualty. And then highlighted the clusters again, basically um, looking at individual towns and um, uh, individual casualties, what that person did. Because um, if sometimes if when you're targeting, part of targeting is you think of uh, second and third, um, second and third tier effects. So if that person is taken out of the battlefield, what's gonna happen um, tomorrow, the next week? And with these military units, their, um, their ability to resupply and to reman themselves is, is pretty horrific. Okay, Duma. Uh, so I don't think I ever knew who hacked Duma, but it was hacked. So Duma is basically like their Senate, uh, their version of the Senate. It's 450 members, and we got everything, right? Absolutely everything. We got uh, all their staff members, we have the actual members themselves, we have their uh, full names, we have their emails and cell phones. Uh, we compared that to some of the Russian troops because uh, military services, uh, we just you know, see how many of the senator's sons are, are fighting the war. It's a little bit more than you would think. Um, but the one thing with Thanos Notebook I should have mentioned before, you can't have duplicates, right? So when, when I see, um, when I'm putting this all together and I have family structures, right? So if there's an exact name match, those two, they don't stay apart. They actually merge into one, which is how we see these connections like this. But then I've broken it down basically uh, for presentation purpose. But if you have to go back uh, from um, an intelligence understanding, you basically would build a product on each one of these individuals, all 450 of them. And then the same type of bulk, uh, 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 ball card type information. So this guy is blank, uh, here's a picture of him, here's his communication devices, website, et cetera. Here's his position in the government. 
and another. This guy is the, and they got such great, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is just, uh, you know, seems interesting to hear that. But. The Russian Interior Ministry. So Russian Interior Ministry is not like our Department of Interior, right? It's kind of like the FBI mixed with the State Department, mixed with ICE and the State Police. Um, Uh, they have, for whatever reason, um, military officers really want to be assigned to this um, entity in the uh, Russian government. So their interior ministry seems like a po quite popular place. So what they do is they get a brand new photo in their dress uniform, and then they uh, send their resume. So now we know what all these guys do, where they've served, and what they look like. And we're talking uh, 50 to 60,000 of these. And they're in different formats. But they talk about what they did, their school, uh, what schools they've been through, overseas assignments, uh, languages, if they have any foreign languages. And what makes Russians dangerous uh, from, an in, from an intel perspective, now we know now that their military is not that great, right? Log uh, not with logistics, not with medical triage, not with actual armor, right? A $130 drone can defeat a you know, $27 million tank. Right? So uh, not really that good at fighting wars, right? But if you notice, like, if you just put a flannel shirt on these guys and put a Miller Lite in his hand, you know, put a St. Louis Cardinals hat on his head, right, talking to him, speak vernacular for the South, right, these guys would just kind of fit in, uh, except for that guy. That guy can't fit in anywhere. But. So that's one thing that makes them dangerous. They can essentially look like us completely, whereas if we go to... If a guy like me goes to China, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm obviously not Chinese. Like, my first deployment was in Djibouti, and I really didn't fit in, you know, uh, just based on looks alone. All right, let's get out of here. Okay, so moving on to different types of dumps. This one's called LA Faces. Now, this is more of, I guess you could say, a political dump. Um, uh, California changed its Public Records Act, and they notified, um, they notified uh, the LA Sheriff's Department that they were going uh, to release the pictures of all uh, 9,310 officers, but not the undercovers, but they did. So they released all the names, all the pictures of the undercovers, it's a counterintelligence nightmare, and it's a, it's a policy failure at an epic level. So if you're, you're working undercover, right, all undercover operations stopped. Oops, let's go back. Uh, to kind of put this into perspective, I used autopsy to separate their name and their uh, name and their badge number to get it on the chart. It's just individuals. So, but if you were in a gang or you're part of a cartel, right, and you were working with somebody and you were already leery about them, you went through all 9,310 pictures. Like you would, you would take the time to do that. So basically, all undercover operations uh, dead in one day. Iran, so Iran, gets, they get hacked quite a bit anyway. Right now, Op Iran is active with Anonymous, and we're getting some really, really, really great stuff. Uh, it's changing our understanding of how the Iranian government works. But for some of these examples, we're gonna talk about um, uh, their policy invading, or not policy invading. They have uh, invasive software they put on basically all electronics devices that are in the country or against dissidents. Uh, their National Standards Organization, Ministry of Cooperation, Labor and Social Welfare, and Iranian WhatsApp. So the Op Iran, like I said, it's ongoing. Um, the uh, Standards Organization. What we're getting out of this, kind of interesting, didn't really expect, to expect it from this dump, but we're, uh, we have an understanding of what is coming into the country, by whom, and why, uh, and for how much. Cost isn't necessarily expensive. Uh, or, Cost isn't necessarily as important, but let's say we are trying to get something into Iran for, to use for our intel purposes. Now we know exactly what the Iranians are looking at uh, internally and what companies, because, you know, let's say the average salary of a truck driver in Iran is like, you know, maybe $15 a, a quarter, right? So, you know, you go give this guy five, 600 bucks, he's going to drive whatever you want across the border for him, you know? I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple mathematics there. Um, uh, on the left is a letter pertaining to how to classify goods um, coming in um, and how to, essentially they're sanctioned so much they've had to rethink the way they do imports and exports also. So they have policy committees um, and basically guidance. The second one um, 
uh, pertains to inspections. So they do inspect quite a bit and quite heavily, and basically it's a very robust process. We understand who's doing it, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and what are the results. And then tons and tons and tons of propaganda. Like, they're just propaganda anywhere. That's just part of the game in our end. So the top picture is, uh, that is the reigning foreign minister. Um, his name's uh, Hussein Amir Abdul, uh, Abdulian. Um, on the bottom, that's uh, General Soleimani. He was killed in Baghdad airport. Uh, the top's a uh, Iraqi Shiite militia leader who was uh, killed in a separate attack. So this is the um, Ministry of Cooperation, Labor, and Social Welfare, right? And the, uh, that's their logo on the right. On the left is basically the way they track their own citizens, right? So 75 megabytes got breached, and basically in Farsi, they've, uh, if you're somebody they see as a, um, not literally following Islamic law to a T, like they already have your data, they already see the videos that you watch, you know, they, they see your whole internet presence um, that is very restricted anyway. But you get put on one of those lists, things can get really bad for you really quickly. And that hasn't been, I've, I barely scratched the surface on some of these data dumps, so. Um, Iran WhatsApp, basically a big list of cell phones, but why is that important, right? So it's important because if now I have essentially, I can start, uh, I can start in, um, inputting propaganda into a, a new area, to a new audience, basically. So I don't know where these people sit politically with the Iranian government, but it might be a fun, uh, fun to find out, right? So basically you tailor a message, you don't send it to all 450,000, right? You just you know, a thousand at a time. Change the message a little bit. See if you get responses, right? The next, this is, uh, the, a lot of these next ones, you're gonna see me kind of repeat myself a lot of the same things. It's like passwords, 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 password policies, uh, do things, don't do things like they do in, in Asia and uh, especially some of these crypto programs, right? So, pay them. It's basically India's, uh, it's India's uh, PayPal, basically. It's a payment app, right? huge, huge amount of data, right? So we have all the user, we have the, the name, the cell phone, the email, we have, and a lot of times their passport information, everything, right? So if you need to go and take this information and start creating new accounts or redoing password, you have mother's maiden name, you have all the pedigree information that's necessary for you to do that. So this is kind of the raw, what it looks like raw, and then processed for different data sets, so. You can see what bank, what bank account, what area, and basically everything. German mobile. So this is a, uh, this was leaked on Telegram and uh, several deep and dark web um, uh, locations, hacked somewhere around August, right? Huge, 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 huge list. Uh, this one's 20,000, because once it gets bigger, you can't really see it on the screen. So why would that be important? So. Same thing. Now, if you are an opposition party to some um, some type of political party in Germany, right? Now you have this giant list, and you just start sending sending names out, right? Sending propaganda. Another example: speed sports, Pakistan. It's Pakistan's largest, um, basically, a, a, it's a sports equipment online store. Huge amounts of data, incredibly huge amounts of data. And here's how, an example of how it's broken down. So we have basically the person, where they lived, all the pedigree information, everything you would basically fill out for a credit card, uh, cell phones, emails, and uh, passports and account numbers. Uh, U-Shop, uh, it was apparently US based, but now I don't think it is anymore. It's just they're kind of odd, really odd company. Uh, this one was released on Telegram. It's basically all their usernames and passwords. Like I said before, you know, uh, this one I separate a little different as, um, as kind of an experiment. So instead of being clustered by, um, instead of being clustered by the password, I clustered this one by the actual dollar amount of the purchases they made. So we can have some pattern of life development based on spending patterns for individuals. This gentleman's been in the news quite a bit lately, uh, Kraken Crypto, right? Uh, his name's Jesse Powell. Um, he's been investigated by the FBI starting in March. Uh, there's claims of uh, stalking. And basically from his crypto exchange, millions and millions of dollars are missing. So this is just a small cross section. This is 5,000 of the transactions that happened with um, 
within his system. But we have the username and we have the password and we have all the account data, right? So if you wanted to go in for these, you know, uh, 20 million users, right? Look for accounts that have, you know, somebody who is like your friend uh, sent you a link and if you, you, you create your own account, you get five free tokens or, or whatever, right? Find all those accounts at that same level and log into their account and send that crypto over to your Tumblr, right? And steal all of it. There's a, there's a huge criminal um, opportunity, um, unfortunately, with all this data. Grow your base crypto. Um, they've been breached twice. Um, they're very, they haven't commented that much about their breaches, but they are incredibly bad. Um, so all their username and passwords, accounts, account dollar amount, um, all the, all the, all everything that you've seen in every other one, it's, it's in this one. And the same issues, password issues, right? Stop using shitty passwords, right? Um, if you're using shitty passwords and the like, password lists that are released all the time, that's real. Like people actually use those passwords. You know, they don't know any better. And with just the data, this data alone, just in this brief, I mean, you could you could breach thirty thousand people, right? Especially if you could automate it. GitHub, another the same example, right? So this is all uh, usernames and passwords released on Telegram. Uh, poor response and remedial action. So this company still hasn't fully made their users uh, redo their passwords, right? So it's still wide open. And just like we saw before, this is 360,000 out of millions, right? Shouldn't see clusters if you have good policies, but you still see the clusters. So you still have the QWERTY one, two, threes. Um, you still have one, 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 two, 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 you know. Um, so changing the standards, I mean, at least most American companies uh, have different policies than they do in these foreign ones, but it is a total mess. Uh, this was a super shady business, so hashing ad space, if you are doing any business with them, it looks like probably not a good, not a good place to work or do business. But like you see that um, the graphic, username and passwords across the board, tons and tons and tons of them. And this is just a partial master, and then the micro examples. So here we see again, you know, password one. Uh, in some of these examples, they'll, they put the place that they're from, like we'll see a password that says Pakistan. It's like, I bet you 10 bucks the guy's from Pakistan, right? Bitfinex exchange, 440,000 uh, usernames and passwords released, hacked in May of, of this year. A um, lot of security lapses, $72 million was stolen from them in a previous hack in 2016. Uh, and see, we see the same problem. We see clustering. Clustering is really bad. Um, uh, one of the people that I'm working with on this project uh, said that they haven't forced a password reset either. So, um, well, I kind of said this before, but Pakistan123, like if you see something like that, it gives us passwords, tell us a little bit about the people, right? They're either woefully um, unskilled or don't understand security at all, or sometimes you say something about yourself within your password. And bottom right, uh, Kimberly is super angry, so. So these are my final slides. All right, so can you affect the battlefield from home? This is more based on Russia and Ukraine, and the simple answer is yes. Now it's a little bit more complicated than just clicking a button and writing a message or, or coming here today and giving a talk and raising awareness. Um, it's called VIRS, uh, Visual Infrared Imaging Radio Metric Suite. So this is a NOAA satellite based in uh, Northern Virginia, but it's also international, right? Look, it was originally um, used to watch the environment, watch uh, sea temperatures, things like that. Uh, it has about 20 satellites, uh, but it can see in IR. Well, let me go back real quick. So, the same, uh, the same way we would look at forest fire tracking, right? We can also see muzzle flashes from tanks and artillery. Uh, you can't really see Small arms, but you can see tanks, you can see artillery, and Navy guns, for say, right? So here's an example from, uh, uh, from this um, platform, right? So uh, January 2022, uh, this is uh, Keith, you know, before the evasion, then after. It's just night lights, right? The geosynchronous orbits of the satellites, so they're different, you know, different orbits, different satellites, different qualities. But you can use the same, uh, it's real-time, real-time feed, right? So you can do basically a, a grid square. You can find an area if you're trying to look at that. You can do a grid square and 
see troop movements. So this is the buildup in Belarus before they entered. Um, entered. And uh, you know, a lot of people just ignored it. It's like, well, okay, well, they're just Russian troops moving around, right? Well, it's, sometimes it's not just Russian troops moving around. It's more than that. You can also see with their change detection, you can see where they're building trenches and the ways they're building trenches. So if you know exactly where this is at, and you do, because it gives you basically a 16-digit grid, you know, or a lat long, sorry. Um, then if you're a Ukrainian drone commander, right, you know exactly where you need that drone to go. And then you know exactly what their uh, tunnel system or trench system looks like. And then what you can do is like if you, if you highlight an area and you get an alert um, and you said they noticed a muzzle flash, you can then take that, the lat long, um, and you can basically throw it into Telegram. And then from Telegram, you know, they'll probably say thank you in English and wait 30 minutes and you'll probably see another flash in that same location. That's the counter battery coming in. So, but at that, uh, this is my contact information and the contact information for my boss. Uh, uh, feel free to reach out to me, right? Shoot me a text, uh, find me on social media, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm pretty much everywhere. Uh, Ask questions. Um, if you hate me a lot, let my boss know. <laughs> I'd rather you didn't. Uh, but if you really uh, like this talk and uh, you want to see the next iteration, um, by all means, I mean, please hit me up. And at that, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, can I answer any questions for you guys? And I can barely see you, so you got to, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, shoot, shoot me an email. Yeah, uh, but so it, it's no longer owned by uh, IBM. It's now owned by Harris Computer. So the IBM, um, IBM lost, its, my understanding is IBM lost its trademark, but it was $9,500 um, that last time I looked. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's pricey, but compared to Palantir, which is no longer being used by the, um, by the government or military, which is like basically a million dollars for the server and license with uh, exceptional capabilities, so. Anybody else? Yeah. So the, uh, the, the it was called Speed Store, the, the Store website, right? Um, they said in that collection there was every information under that source. Right? Yeah. That was all that one source? Yep, the single source. And that's a great question. They shouldn't, right? And so, like, whenever I sign up for something, uh, this one, or, yeah. So whenever I sign up for something, like, I always have, if, unless it's absolutely necessary, like, I just put in fake information, whereas they're essentially more honest with themselves, I guess. I don't think, like, a lot of people, the American inclination is that they're asking that information because they're going to try to keep tabs on you and tailor ads and sell your data, right? It seems like some of that's going on, for sure. Um, they just want to know about their user base, it seems. Um, the emails that I have read when I've gone through um, this data don't seem to indicate uh, it's nefarious. They're just asking for a lot right off the bat. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, no, no, he's uh, he's he posts on a regular basis on social media, so he's not uh, he is not incarcerated currently, as far as I know. So, okay. Um, listen, if you guys got any questions that you don't want to ask publicly, of course, I'm going to be here for you know until the con ends this evening, and I really appreciate your time. So. Thanks.